Hello everybody, Dane here, and today I'm going to be making a start on my review of Hunters of Dune by Brian Herbert and Kevin J. Anderson. So this is the long-awaited sequel to Chapter House Dune, so book number seven in the original Dune series. It is based on notes that, um, that Frank Herbert left behind as well. And, uh, well, let's get into it. I'll check out the blurb here, and then I'll share some of my tabs, and this is going to be more of a vlog as I go through and read this book, because it will take me a few days. So, Dane reads... Hunters of Dune is the first of two breathtaking journeys into the world of Dune as it remakes itself in a new form after its greatest crisis. Since 1986, millions of readers have longed to know the ending of the uncompleted story which began in Heretics of Dune and continued in Chapter House Dune. Fleeing from the monstrous honoured Maitres, dark counterparts of the Bene Gesserit Sisterhood, Duncan Idaho, a woman named Shiana who can talk to sandworms, the military genius Bashar Miles Tegg and a group of desperate refugees explore the boundaries of the universe. Aboard their sophisticated no-ship, they have used long-stored cells to resurrect heroes and villains from the past including Paul Mwadib and his love Chani, Lady Jessica, Thufir Hawat, even the traitor Dr. Yue, all in preparation for a final confrontation with a mysterious outside enemy so great it can destroy even the terrible honoured maters. And deep in the hold of their giant ship, the refugees carry the last surviving sandworms from devastated Arrakis as they search the universe for a new dune. In the prelude to Dune and Legends of Dune sequences, Brian Herbert and Kevin J. Anderson told the history of the Dune universe. Have you read all the books? Well, I've read all the books that bring us up to when this was published, at least. I mean, give me a chance. Great line in this. I must not confuse mutual addiction with love. Uh, that is something that I need to remember myself. Uh, as always, we have like chapter headings that include like quotes from various either speeches or books or whatever from within the Dune universe. And this one here is a pretty good one. Learn how to recognize your greatest enemy. It may even be yourself. That was Mother Commander Mobea from Chapter House Archives. And this is from the Telexal, I can't say their names, but Telexal Master Saitail in Wisdom for My Successor. Is there a more terrifying sensation than to stand on the brink and peer into the void of an empty future? Extinction not only of your life, but of all that has been accomplished by your forefathers. If we Telexo plunge into the abyss of nothingness, does our race's long history signify anything at all? And that's something, a thought, a similar thought to that as kind of plague me for a while. I mean, specifically, like, I think about some of the existential crises humanity faces, like global warming, um, climate extinction, overpopulation, things like that. Um, even, like, the eventual heat death of the sun. Like, does it mean that everything is pointless? Because eventually it's all going to just be nothing anyway. I, I don't know, mate. I haven't, got, I haven't got any answers for you. I'm sorry. So here we get the uh, first kind of reference to what's going on um, that we covered in on the blurb about people being brought back from the dead. Uh, and we get a list of who we might potentially be seeing. So uh, this is Saitail, the Tlalaxu. I think I'm saying that right, I don't know. He touched his chest, knowing that implanted beneath his skin was a hitherto undetected null entropy capsule, a tiny treasure trove of preserved cells that the Tlaxu had collected for thousands upon thousands of years. Key figures from history were contained therein, obtained from secret scrapings of dead bodies. Tlaxu masters, face dancers, even Paul Mwadib, Duke Leto Atreides and Jessica, Chani, Stilgar, the tyrant Leto II, Gurney Halleck, Thufir Hawat, and other legendary figures all the way back to Serena Butler and Xavier Harkonnen from the Butlerian Jihad. And as I've just finished reading the Butler and Jihad books, that's kind of cool. I hope they come back. That'd be interesting. It's a great quote here from the collected sayings of Mwadi by the Princess Arulan. There is no escape. We pay for the violence of our ancestors. And that's very true. Again, that just makes me think of, you know, some of the historic injustices of the, the British Empire, for example. Um, you know, as a British person, I need to be aware of that and to feel very bad. Which I do. So then we get a goal aboard and it is Welcome back Baron Vladimir Harkonnen Dun 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 For some reason I, it doesn't bother me too much in June But in general I hate it when you have like people having fake out deaths And people coming back from the dead Normally really winds me up But with June for whatever reason I'm okay with it Okay then we have a quote from Mother Superior Dawi Adrad No land or sea or planet is forever Wherever we stand we are only stewards Again very relevant to our own world Especially in today's day and age And I thought this was an interesting quote It's the kind of thing that you hear dictators say During times of peace and prosperity Freedom and diversity are considered absolute rights With a monumental crisis facing us however Such concepts become disruptive and self-indulgent mm. And Duncan has this thought which is interesting If a miracle was created by technology Was it still a miracle? I mean, I would argue yes, but then I would say true miracles don't exist because there is no God. All right, Crone, from a private communicator to his face dancer operatives, he said, When one has an obvious need, one has an obvious weakness. 
Take care when you make a request, for in doing so, you reveal your vulnerability. And then uh, Bene Gesserit Suk Dr. Floriana Nikus said, The treatment of an injury may hurt more than the wound itself. Do not allow a sore to fester because you are unwilling to tolerate the momentary pain. Um, I'm getting a root canal in two weeks and my teeth are absolutely fine. I have no pain whatsoever, but I've got to go and sit there for two hours having my mouth drilled. So I can relate to that one. And we get a reference to some people looking at a Van Gogh painting, and I was like, there's no way a Van Gogh painting would have set, like, survived this long. We're talking, like, what, seven, eight thousand years at least into the future. Um, and then we get, a genius from Ix had restored and enhanced the original. An invisibly thin but tough coating of plaz sealed and protected the masterwork from further aging. Okay, now I've got my answer. I do like it like when that happens, when, like, I have a problem with part of a book or whatever, and then the book itself addresses it, and I'm like, good, the author has thought of this. Mother Commander Morbella, rally before troop deployment, she said, the best method of attack is to make a quick kill. Always be ready to strike your opponent's jugular. If you want to provide a performance, be a dancer. And uh, Duncan has imposed a regular diurnal shifting of bright lights and dimness to stimulate to simulate days and nights because they're spending like 20 years or whatever on this spaceship. And we also get Leto II, the goaler of him is brought back. And even when he's a child and doesn't have his memories, he has a bit of a moment where he transforms into a sandworm. Very cool. Uh, we get a reference to Duncan wall gathering as well, which just made me think of Charles Heathcote and his wall gathering videos here on BookTube. Um, I will say Duncan Idaho is one of my favourite characters and so it was really good to see him essentially being the protagonist of this book, you know. So we've got, what is it, uh, Doria, who's one of the, I think she's one of the Reverend Mothers. I can't remember, she's either one of those or the Matras. There's, it's confusing to me, you know, and I've read like 10 of these books. But anyway, she has a voice inside her head because she killed somebody and then she was forced to like absorb them inside her that, so that she could like continue to benefit from her knowledge and wisdom. And the voice inside her head goes, In ancient times on Terra, people had something called a doorbell, which a visitor rang when coming to a door. And she says that's their name because it's Doria and Belonda, doorbell. And anyway, they, they end up, Doria's like confronting these sandworms and we, we just get this, which I thought was funny. Belonda has a great line here. Doria stared wide-eyed. The creatures were each at least 20 meters long and moved with astonishing speed. Be gone! Back to your desert! You're not Shiana. The worms will not do as you say. Crystal teeth flashed as the worms darted forward, scooping up sand and sisters, swallowing victims into the furnaces of their gullets. Idiot! Belonda within exclaimed. Now you've killed me twice! A fraction of a second later, a worm rose up then dove down, consuming Doria in a single mouthful. At last, the irksome voice went quiet within. All right, so here we have a quote from a Bene Gesserit report. Each civilization, no matter how altruistic it purports to be, has its means of interrogating and torturing prisoners, as well as an elaborate system to justify such actions. Sounds about right. And then we hear, here we have a quote from Perton, ancient Mentat philosopher. A choice can be as dangerous as a weapon. Refusing to choose is in itself a choice. Which I agree with. And another, this quote is actually just dur uh, throughout the narrative, but I think it's uh, a pretty good one. If you don't want an opponent to see your hidden dagger, make certain an obvious weapon looks large and deadly. And then we hear, have we have from uh, Bashir Miles Tegg's address to the troops, he said, Our defences can become liabilities if they betray our true weaknesses to the enemy. And then from Howat's strategic corollary, he said, The enemy of your enemy is not necessarily your friend. He may hate you as much as any other rival. And uh, Norma Senva comes back, a blast from the past. And the final quote here I wanted to share is from the recorded speeches of Mwadib, edited by the Paul Atreides Gola. The future is not for us to see as passive observers, but for us to create, and I think that's very true. So overall, Hunters of June by Brian Herbert and Kevin J. Anderson. I gave this one like a 3.5 out of 5, but a strong one. I thought it was a pretty good continuation of the June series, and it kind of helps us to, to get towards what Frank Herbert's actual vision was for the end of the, of the series. And uh, I would recommend, I mean, probably, if you've just read the original six June books, other than reading through in um, like publication date order, this is a pretty good place to go to after Chapter House June because it just continues on from that. So there we have it. That's what I made of Hunters of June by Brian Herbert and Kevin J. Anderson. As always, don't forget to let me know in the comments what you thought of this book if you read it. Hit that like button if you've enjoyed this video. Hit that subscribe button for more and I will see you soon for another bookish video. Thanks a lot. Bye-bye.